Today I want to talk a little bit about the idea of risk because when it comes to investing, whether it's in real estate or stocks or anything else, risk represents more than half the game. The risk I'm talking about is going to be a little different than the type of risk that we hear from the finance industry uh, that uses something called the capital asset pricing model as its basis for risk. The capital asset pricing model is an interesting elegant mathematical model but it doesn't really help uh, individual investors uh, make better risk adjusted returns. There's an idea out there that if you want more return you have to take on more risk and that idea is false. Let me repeat that again. More risk does not correlate with higher returns. Since real estate seems to be everyone's favorite topic at the moment and represents such a high percentage of the average Canadian family's wealth, I thought I'd talk about risk in the context of real estate investing. But what I say here also applies to other forms of investing as well. Risk is primarily the potential for loss of capital. And when it comes to things like stock investing and real estate investing, we're putting up a lot of capital and so the risk we take on is quite high. There's a bunch of different types of risk that aren't frequently talked about in the media that the average Canadian investor faces. The first and most obvious type of risk that a real estate investor faces is leverage risk. Now what's leverage? Basically leverage is the amount of money that you borrow in order to acquire an asset. So leverage is a double-edged sword. It uh, magnifies things uh, on the upside when things are going well. So leverage is great on the way up, but on the way down leverage is really quite bad. It actually it, it magnifies your losses. The way leverage of risk manifests itself is uh, when assets that you bought with too much debt start to fall in price and you can no longer service that debt, you need to sell them in a panic. And that, and when everyone does that at, a, at the same time, prices drop precipitously and uh, things get really, really terrible. Great historical example of this, of course, is what happened to Japan in the late 1980s, early 1990s. The next type of risk faced by any investor, uh, particularly real estate investors, is what I call ignorance risk. First of all, they've got um, real estate professionals who are unregulated. The, re the real estate industry in Canada is an unregulated joke where real estate professionals can go around making all kinds of ludicrous claims about future returns and immigration and all this other nonsense that they have no basis to make. Um, so the, the agent is potentially working against your interests. That's the first problem. The second problem is people are just generally ignorant about where the returns from real estate come from. I did a piece on real estate math that I suggest you check out because when it comes to real estate uh, returns, we need to look at things other than price to price comparisons. We need to look at all the cash flows associated with it to at least have an understanding of where the real returns are. What people will find is that the returns have actually been uh, much lower than is generally thought. Now, this type of ignorance risk is particularly pernicious because if you are investing in the dark and you have no way of even valuing a thing or understanding what your expectations from it are or you're being potentially lied to by a, uh, an unethical real estate industry, you're, you're really, really operating in the dark. And so what you need to do is understand that uh, ignorance risk is another one, a, a big risk that you face and you need to overcome it. Another form of risk that affects all investors and real estate investors in particular uh, and is related to the ignorance risk is interest rate risk. And I say it's related to ignorance risk because people don't really have a good sense of where interest rates come from. We hear from central bankers that they get to set uh, reserve requirements at banks, for example, or overnight rates and they keep they, they either have an expansionary or a retractionary interest rate policy and so on. And we, we leave it at that. We assume that they have uh, full authority and full power to do that. But oftentimes, there's lots of history to suggest this, the bond market itself imposes on central bankers a kind of discipline which is harmful to investors in that economy. In 2007, the United States was selling about $68 billion a month in U.S. Treasury bills. Um, and now that they've dropped interest rates to uh, record lows, they're only selling about $8 billion. Sooner or later, what might happen is the bond market might uh, insist that the United States raise interest rates if they want to keep borrowing money at the rate they were borrowing before because these net uh, providers of credit like the Japanese and the Chinese for example when they start cashing in retirements en masse and need to start funding retirement are going to become net recipients of credit there's going to be kind of a competition uh, for uh, debts uh, in the global bond market and that's going to potentially lead to higher rates of interest. Central bankers don't have the power and the authority alone to, to set this stuff, sooner or later the bond market itself is going to impose discipline on them. Now it's not inevitable that's going to happen, I'm not saying it, I'm not calling it as a forecast necessarily, but because it's a potential, uh, it's something that uh, real estate investors and investors of all kinds should keep a good eye on.
It's great for me to talk about the risks that we all face, but what do we do about them? Uh, well, I think the first thing we should do is learn to invest slowly. Spend a lot of time kicking the tires, understand all the potential risks associated with buying a big ticket item before you actually put money down or before you sign an obligation to pay for this thing over years and years. Understand where the risks really come from and don't be pressured by any kind of professional, whether it's a financial advisor or a real estate agent, to buy quickly because that real estate agent or financial advisor's interests are for you to buy it quickly so they make the sale faster and they can move on to the next customer. Now, that's not necessarily in your best interest, so invest slowly, understand that an investment that's good in April uh, is probably going to be good again in May and June and July. Things don't turn overnight and don't worry about missing out on opportunity because there's lots of opportunity out there. Second piece of advice I think is to focus your mind more on uh, the potential complexities around something rather than actually the upside or the potential that it has. Uh, everything has a catch attached to it. To figure out what those catches are. So in the case of real estate investing, what are the intermittent cash flows? What kind of property taxes are you expected to pay now? What do you think the property taxes are going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now? Because a, real a piece of real estate is a long dated asset. And so you got to try to Think what things are going to be like in five, ten years, difficult as that may be. And if it's too difficult, maybe real estate investing isn't for you. What are the uh, likely unexpected cash flows coming at the thing that no one ever talks about when you buy? How frequently are you going to need to make a call to the plumber or to the electrician or to the general contractor? Those are sort of things to look at uh, related to the first point about kicking the tires. Uh, really try to, in your mind, talk down the value of the asset and understand that there's catches associated with it understand what those catches are and price those into your return expectations. Next, I'd say when it comes to investing in anything, you want to try to buy cheaply because when you buy cheaply, uh, you have embedded within that some insulation against potential risk. You're going to take on risk. You need to be, you need to insist that you're going to be compensated for it. And the way that you're compensated for taking on risk is by buying things at a lower price. What Warren Buffett has called, I think, his, uh, it's related to his idea of the economic moat around something. When you buy something that's uh, less than its intrinsic value, you're insulated in a way from a lot of the pain associated with it. Whereas if you overpay for something or if you pay top dollar for something, things have to work out perfectly in the world for you not to get hammered. And rarely do things work out perfectly in the world. That's just the nature of reality. And finally, I think uh, investors need to think creatively about whether or not they can accomplish the same goals with uh, less risk or less capital in the game. So uh, if you're a condo investor, for example, can you buy a condo at a less uh, expensive price? Can you buy a cheaper condo? Can you uh, move to a slightly different city? If you're in the greater Toronto area, for example, can you move to Oakville, Kitchener or Guelph or someplace where you can get real estate? If you want to get into the real estate game, can you get it much more cheaply. It may be a pain to commute, but uh, paying $300,000 less for something really mitigates a lot of pain. And if you're a stock investor, for example, uh, can you achieve the goal of uh, getting all the upside with less uh, potential downside using stock options in the case of a stock investor? Basically think about how you can get all the taste with fewer of the calories when it comes to investing. And that's pretty much it on, uh, in terms of my piece on risk. Uh, if you have any comments or any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As usual, thank you very much for watching. And uh, if you like what you see here, uh, feel free to share the wealth. We're always looking to build a community, so thank you very much.